Hello, my name is Maurice Leeson. I'm one of the administrators of the Spear and Surname Project, and this is a presentation that I gave at Back to Our Past uh, on the 13th of October 2012. Um, now, the Spear and Surname Project is a project that utilizes DNA to help uh, break through some brick walls in our family tree. And it's uh, run by myself and uh, a group of uh, researchers, uh, some of whom whom have been researching the Spiran family tree for many, many years. And hopefully this presentation will give you some idea of how DNA can help you uh, in your family tree research and how it can help you break down your brick walls. In every family tree, sooner or later you will hit these brick walls. And this is a typical family tree, in fact it's my own, and you can see that I'm fine back to about my great-great-grandparents, but when I hit my great-great-great-grandparents there are several gaps. In fact I cannot identify 14 out of the 32. Uh, so uh, this is after uh, exhausting the usual sources such as family lore, uh, the 1901 and 1911 censuses, uh, Griffith's valuation, and the cancelled books uh, in the valuation office uh, have been very helpful. Then, of course, there's birth, births, marriages and deaths, uh, the church records, uh, various newspapers are available now online, uh, that last Nevin records for anybody with Dublin ancestors are invaluable, and the 1939 electoral rolls. So these are the kind of sources I've used, and now I have uh, hit these brick walls, um, I have turned to DNA to try and answer some of the questions that still remain. Uh, what is involved in DNA testing? Uh, you have to scrape your cheek uh, with what looks like a very large cotton bud and you'll get the kit to do this in the post from uh, any one of the number of uh, DNA testing companies that are available and it can be a fun thing um, you can uh, invite people around and get a group of friends uh, together so that maybe several of you can scrape your cheeks at the same time uh, the cheek the the scraping process then dislodges cheek cells from your cheek the top of the swab is then put into a plastic vial, and that plastic vial is shipped by post to uh, the lab. Now, in the lab, they look at your sample, they put it into the machine, they analyze it, and they produce the results. And these results are then posted on your own personalized web page, together with your username, your own uh, unique password for security purposes. And not only that, but they compare your results with the results of every other person they have in their database. And as a result of that process, uh, you um, it produces quite a few matches, people who match you uh, on your uh, DNA. And these matches are also posted on your web page if the people involved have actually given permission for the company to do so. And the idea is that you will now be able to um, collaborate with these matches and hopefully break through some of the brick walls that you have in your family tree. The other very important aspect of uh, this testing process is that uh, a lot of the people who have already tested with the particular company will have got together to form various projects. And these projects might be uh, involve a particular surname, they might involve a particular geographical area, and when you take the test and get the results, it is important to see if there is perhaps a project for your own particular surname or for a particular geographical area of interest to you. Types of DNA testing. Three types of DNA test, and the first one is the Y DNA test. And the, the Y chromosome is passed on from father to son. So the Y DNA test will measure your direct male line all the way back about 60,000 years um, uh, because it will trace the Y DNA back to your father, his father, his father, his father, and so on. Uh, this is a test that can only be done in men because, of course, the Y chromosome is not passed on to women. It's only passed on to men. So this is the first type of test. The second type of test is the mitochondrial DNA test. And this is a test that can be taken by both men and women. And uh, the mitochondria are passed on from mothers to their children. So your mitochondrial DNA will have been passed down to you from your mother, and she will have got it from her mother, and she will have got it from her mother, and her mother, and so on and so on, all the way back along a direct female line going back to about 150,000 years. That's the current reach of that particular test.
The third main type of DNA test is the autosomal DNA test, and this goes back to about seven generations, uh, including yourself, um, which has a reach of approximately about 210 years, and that would take you back approximately to your four times great grandparents, um, and there are 64 of them in your family tree. So, in terms of to DNA testing, there are generally two types of approach. The first approach is a fishing trip, the second is asking a specific question. Now with a fishing trip, you just uh, do the test and see what you catch. Uh, it's, it's really potluck. There may be somebody out there that matches you, um, and if there are, you might be lucky enough that they've already been tested, and when you test and your results are compared with the rest of the people in the database, it comes up as a match. And then uh, you just contact that person and take it from there, see where you actually hook up with each other. In terms of the specific question, it's usually along the, the lines of, oh, I'm sure we're related to that crowd. Um, I wonder um, who, I wonder if, if, if we match genetically. So um, with the fishing trip, you only need, to, only you need to take the test. But with the specific question, it's usually you and someone else who needs to take the test. Now, that all has implications. Before we get on to looking at a few examples of um, the Y-DNA test and the various other types of tests and what kind of results you get, I need to say a few words about probability. Very few things in family tree research are conclusive, and there is no such thing as definite proof, usually. Most conclusions are based on the balance of probabilities, and so too exactly the same with DNA evidence. But DNA evidence will point you in the direction of the most probable explanation, and therein lies its, lies its usefulness. And we'll see this in a couple of examples uh, that I'm going to tell you about now uh, shortly. But at the first type of DNA test, and this, this is the Y DNA test, which has a reach of approximately 60,000 years. This test um, uh, goes back along the line, the direct male line, and um, here's my family tree again, and uh, in my particular instance, uh, I bought the test, but then decided it would make a great Christmas present for my father, so I gave it to him uh, so that he could do the test. And of course, his results would be exactly the same as my results, because he is my biological father, or at least that's what I firmly believe on the balance of probabilities. I later confirmed that this in fact was the case uh, when we did the autosomal testing. But let's first look at what I mean by the direct. Now here is the direct male line, let's move it over to the side, and if we get rid of uh, all the other lines in my family tree and just look at the direct male line. Now for the sake of argument, say I took the test. The uh, Y-DNA test would then be able to match me with people who are on a direct male line to my father, so in other words, my brothers, people who are on a direct male line to my father's father, so that would be my Gleason um, cousins, first cousins, and Gleason uncles, then those who are on a direct male line to my father's father's father, so that would be my Gleason second cousins, uh, Gleason second cousins once removed, Gleason second cousins twice removed, um, uh, and so on, people related to my uh, great-great-grandfather and to my great-great-great-grandfather. And here we're back to about 1800, and this is where the um, uh, brick walls begin. Um, and then go back further to fourth cousins, fifth cousins, sixth cousins, and so on, all the way back to... Um, uh, well, all the way back up to about 60,000 years ago. So this is the value of the um, the Y-DNA test. Now, um, like I say, my dad took the test, and when the it showed, and here is a, a, a sample of what the results page will look like, and you don't really need to see the detail, but um, there are, in this particular uh, image, four panels of results. Um, the first row uh, names all the various markers along the Y chromosome, and the second row uh, names the, uh, or has the values for each of these markers in turn. And um, this represents uh, your genetic signature, or the uh, technical term is the haplotype. Now, um, just to say a 
quick word about markers. There are generally two types of marker on the chromosome, on all chromosomes, including the Y chromosome. Uh, the first type of marker is called the STR marker, or the short tandem repeat. And the second type of marker is called the SNP, the single nucleotide polymorphism. Um, and uh, different companies will do different tests on uh, different chromosomes, so it is probably worthwhile being clear which particular marker is being tested by which particular test. Now, as well as that, Family Tree DNA, the company that we tested with, sent us a very nice map of uh, uh, the migration of our particular uh, group out of Africa. And um, uh, the reason why, well, this particular group that I belong to is called haplogroup OR1B. Um, and then when we did further testing, we further refined it to haplogroup OR1B1A2A1A1B4. Uh, and basically what a haplogroup is, is just it's a collection of people with a similar genetic signature. And the reason why um, people developed different genetic signatures over time and belonged to different haplogroups is because as humans emerged from Africa all those many thousands of years ago um, and crossed over into Arabia and then maybe southern Europe, Turkey, um, one group went off to India, another group went off to Australia, another group went off to Europe, another group went off to North America and as they came out of Africa and they were passing their DNA on to their offspring, copying it, passing it on, copying it, passing it on. Mistakes occurred during the copying process so that the offspring inherited these mistakes as mutations. Now, these mutations accumulate over time in any given group of people. Um, but when the crowd went off to Australia, they developed their own unique set of mutations. Similarly the, crowd, similarly, the crowd that went off to Europe, they developed their own unique mutations and, and so on and so on. So over time, over tens of thousands of years, humans, as they emerged from Africa, different groups developed their own unique characteristic genetic signature. And that is what is meant by the various haplogroups. Um, my particular haplogroup, R1B1A2A1A1B4, is the most common haplogroup in Ireland. Um, it has its highest concentration in Ireland, less so in England, and much less so when you get to Europe. So this would indicate that the uh, particular group to which I belong is probably the same kind of genetic signature that was present in the first people to populate Ireland all those many years ago when it was still connected by a land bridge to mainland Europe. Um, so we're talking about the first people in Ireland, which is about 6,000 years ago. So my Gleeson clan would have descended from these people. All very, very interesting, but it doesn't actually tell me who my great-great-great-grandfather was on the Gleeson side. For that, I have to go and look at my map. Um, there are various... Uh, panels of markers that you can look at. Um, my dad took the 67 marker test and on the first 12 markers we had two and a half thousand matches. On the next 25 markers we had 56 matches so it came down quite considerably when you started looking at more markers. At 37 markers we only had five matches so considerably reduced and at 67 markers we only had two matches. But let's look at the 37 marker uh, results and here they are on this particular page and um, the names of the various people are, are on the left hand side. I've blotted out the first names so you can't uh, for, for privacy reasons and you see we have a McLaughlin, a McMahon, a Gleason, a Neville and the last person has chosen to keep their results private so we don't know anything about that particular individual. Now what these results indicate is that I am definitely genetically related to these people. But they're obviously not Gleasons. Three of them don't share the Gleason surname. And that means that I'm related to them definitely, but probably before the advent of surnames. So the common ancestor that I would share with these people would be way back more than a thousand years ago. Um, so that doesn't really, it's not very helpful really in terms of of uh, helping me break through brick walls in my uh, more recent ancestors. 
the the one Gleason match that I have there suggests that I'm definitely related to this person and within the last 1,000 years since the advent of surnames because we share the same surname. But if you look over to the left-hand side and the column marked steps, you'll see that uh, there is a, I'm four steps away from an exact match with this person. And at 37 markers, four steps is, 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 is quite a lot. It probably means that um, I'm probably related to him perhaps uh, in the last 300 to 600 years rather than within the last 200 to 300 years. So uh, the less steps, you know, if the steps were, were zero and it was an exact match, then I would be uh, much more closely related to him. So, this fishing trip has not caught much yet. I'll just have to sit and wait and hope that somebody else uh, tests some of the Gleason tests with family tree DNA and that they are a much closer match than anything that I have so far. Um, and this is not unusual. Many people will test and you'll find that you don't have, you have matches but you don't have close matches. But let me turn now to a specific example of um, how WIDE has helped to address a specific question.